full screen. There we go. Just for people who aren't here, let's see. Pictures. All right, everybody. So, Captain Watson can see me here. This is Mike with the plantbaseddiet.org. This is Loud and Veg Fest, and he is coming to us, our first guest ever, to do a remote presentation on our big six foot tall by 12 foot wide video wall. Captain Watson, you can't see that. You get to see the audience, but they can see you. You look bigger than you would be if you were standing here, actually. <laughs> and you'll, everyone in the audience, you know, he has, Captain Watson has an hour here, and uh, we want him to get going right away to get his talk and then maybe do some Q&A after he's done. So give a big round of applause for Captain Paul Watson from Sea Shepherd. Well, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you, even though I'm over here in Vermont on the other side of the, uh, of the ocean. Uh, I guess uh, what I'd like to do is tell you what Sea Shepherd uh, is up to right now, which is uh, quite a bit because we're a global movement. We're in 42 different countries. Right now we have 10 ships out uh, on the uh, water and uh, doing anti-poaching work primarily. So we have uh, the Sam Simon and the Bob Barker, our two, two of our larger ships have just returned from the coast of um, West Africa. And there we're... Partnerships with numerous uh, African nations, uh, most recently with Gabon. And um, about last month, uh, we went out and we caught uh, a poacher, well, actually a fisher person. It wasn't poaching at the time, but what he did have was uh, uh, two humpback whales in his, uh, in his net. So we ordered him to release the whales. He refused. Now, what he didn't realize was that on board, uh, the, the Bob Barker was uh, the minister for fisheries for Gabon. And uh, so he was arrested, brought back into uh, into Gabon, and then the next week, the Gabonese minister uh, for the for fisheries and the minister for the environment ruled that there will be no more shrimp fishing in Gabonese waters because it's a very destructive fishery. So that has com been completely shut down. So our partnerships are really paying off with Liberia, with Santome, with Togo, with uh, Sierra Leone, and Cabo Verde, with Tanzania, and Namibia. Now, what we do is we send our vessels to Sam Simon or the, uh, or the Bob Barker into those waters, and the poachers never know whose waters we're going to be going into. So every time we're catching them as we go in. But the great thing is that it's acted as a big deterrent to keep poachers out. Now, these poachers are primarily European and Asian uh, fish fleets that are coming in and plundering the waters uh, of Africa. Now, we always hear about the pirates of, uh, of Somalia or the pirates of the Gulf of Guinea. Well, the real pirates are these industrialized trawlers that come in and just take everything, driving local people into poverty, forcing a lot of them into piracy. And uh, it's, a, it's a real dilemma that uh, is going to get worse and worse. So really, Asian and European fishing fleets are stealing the, um, the water, uh, all of the resources out of West African waters. We're also doing the same thing in partnership with um, South America. We have partnerships with Peru, with Colombia, uh, with Mexico and Panama. And uh, just last month, our vessel, the Ocean Warrior, uh, returned from the Eastern Tropical Pacific where we were able to document uh, numerous uh, violations by the Chinese fishing fleet. Uh, there's about 400 of these vessels operating out there and uh, very close to the Galapagos Island and the Galapagos Island Marine Reserve. And so we were able to document uh, dozens and dozens of infractions. The other thing that we were able to document because we had Associated Press and Univision on board was that a lot of these vessels had virtual slaves on board that were doing the work. One guy tried to call, call out to us uh, said he hadn't heard of any, anything from anybody for two years. He managed to throw a bottle out to us with a phone number. And when we called it, it was uh, his brother uh, in Indonesia uh, who said he hadn't heard from him for two years. So this is really not just overfishing, uh, illegal fishing, but it's also a, a, human's right, a human rights issue too. The, uh, we have two vessels in the Mediterranean uh, right now. Uh, that's the Conrad and uh, the Sea Eagle. And what they're doing is intercepting poachers and confiscating up what they call fish aggregating devices, which are illegally set in the Mediterranean by, uh, by poachers. So I think we've taken over a thousand of those out of the Mediterranean waters. In Mexico, uh, we have three vessels that are working to stop the extinction of the endangered vaquita porpoise. Uh, there's less than 20 of them left in the world. 
this is our most dangerous campaign because we're up against the same cartels that uh, deal in drugs. And the reason why that uh, the, the cartels are involved is that the fishery is targeting a, a, a fish called the totoava. And the totoava uh, swim bladder is worth $20,000 a kilo in uh, China. So it's all big money. And uh, the vaquita is a bycatch of the totoava fishery. So over the, the last six years, uh, we've confiscated over a thousand illegal nets. And uh, what this means is that I, I, I'm quite confident if we hadn't been there over the last uh, six years that the vaquita porpoise would now be extinct. So uh, I think this is a very successful campaign and we're going to continue to uh, be there, be a presence confiscating uh, nets and stopping poachers. And when I say it's dangerous, our crews have been attacked. We've had Molotov cocktails thrown at us. We've been shot at, our drones have been shot down, but uh, we haven't backed down in the face of that and we're gonna continue doing that. So we also have um, uh, campaigns around the world trying to stop uh, fish farming which is extremely destructive. It's spreading viruses to, uh, to uh, wild salmon populations and causing uh, a lot of ecological damage. In addition, the, uh, the, the, the salmon farming is extremely, um, it, well, it's a very top, toxic sub substance. And uh, not only is it causing all sorts of environmental problems, the fish itself is heavy uh, with chemicals and uh, uh, antibiotics and uh, even, uh, artificial dyes which are put into the into the feed pellets to color the flesh uh, a pinkish color and because otherwise it would be a dirty white and they wouldn't be able to market that kind of uh, flesh so the, uh, the the domestic salmon farming is is an insidious threat to uh, to ocean ecologies and we're also fighting it in Scotland and in Norway in Chile and Tasmania where uh, these Norwegian based companies are moving in and causing all sorts of, uh, of problems. So uh, we're also doing beach cleanups around the world and especially specializing in um, remote areas like uh, in Northern Australia or Cocos Keeling Island in uh, the Indian Ocean or in Cocos Island off of Costa Rica where we remove seven, 40 tons of, uh, of illegal uh, uh, drift, uh, marine debris which uh, washes up on the shore from primarily from the fishing industry. So it's... Uh, we're all doing this on a large scale, addressing plastic issues, overfishing, illegal fishing. I'm happy to say that on the issue of whaling, that we've had uh, enormous victories there uh, uh, for the Southern Ocean. Uh, we don't have to do that anymore because the uh, Japanese now permanently retreated from the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. During the time that we were there, I, we saved 6,500 whales. It cost them $150 million in losses uh, for their illegal whaling operations. So that was quite a victory. And as of two years ago, no whaling is taking place in international waters anywhere. All whaling today is now restricted to the territorial waters of Norway, the worst defender, Japan, number two, and Denmark, number three. And in that regard, we've been fighting the uh, killing of the pilot whales and the dolphins in the Danish Sparrow Islands, uh, where they're out constantly uh, documenting it, interfering as best we can and putting as much economic pressure as we can and uh, on the on the Faroe Islands and on, on Denmark. The killing of the uh, porpoises, I mean, the dolphins and the pilot whales is a blatant violation of European Union, Union law. And uh, they just simply ignore that. Uh, you know, all cetaceans are protected under EU laws, but they just simply uh, are not enforcing that, which also brings us to the case of France, where we're interfering every year against the taking of uh, dolphins, nearly 10,000 dolphins by the French uh, trawling fleet uh, in the Bay of Biscay. And uh, that's a very controversial campaign in France. In order to get people's attention, we've actually had to take the bodies of dead dolphins and drop them at the Eiffel Tower uh, so that the government would take notice as to, to what's happening. Sea Shepherd uh, has been around for many years. I established uh, the organization in 1977, and uh, I did it with a specific strategy, which I call aggressive nonviolence. That is, we're going to aggressively oppose uh, these poaching operations, uh, but we're going to do it without hurting anybody. And I'm quite proud of the fact that after over four decades, we've not injured, certainly not killed anybody and not injured anybody uh, in, the, in the process, but we have shut down hundreds and hundreds of illegal activities as a result. 
Back in uh, 1978, I established a, on our ships that all the ships would be vegetarian. And in 1999, that all the ships would be vegan. And the reason that uh, we made this uh, rule is because it's very hypocritical to be a conservationist, especially a marine conservationist. And at the same time, uh, you know, supporting the, the meat and fishing industry. About 40% of the fish which is caught out of the ocean is actually isn't eaten by people anyway. It's fed to uh, chickens and to, to pigs, to fur-bearing animals and to salmon farms. So it's extremely destructive. And 65 billion plus uh, animals every year that are slaughtered in slaughterhouses, the single greatest contributor to greenhouse gases on the planet, the single greatest contributor to groundwater pollution, the single greatest computer, uh, contributor to dead zones in the oceans. So uh, it's impossible to be an environmentalist. It's impossible to be a conservationist unless you understand that a plant-based diet is the only way that we can uh, really come to solutions. And the other thing too is that um, factory farms are really giant petri dishes and uh, out of those petri dishes come viruses. So every year they're killing vast numbers of animals to control these viruses, you know, wiping out uh, uh, thousands of pigs at a time, uh, hundreds of thousands of chickens, just exterminating them to so stop the spread of viruses. And uh, we're going to see more and more emergent tsunami transmission of viruses uh, in the coming years. COVID-19, for example, was not a surprise. Lori Garrett wrote a book in 1995 called The Coming Plague. And the problem is, is when you diminish ecosystems and when you diminish diversity in species, you create a situation for zoonomic transmission of viruses from species which are closely related to us, to us. Uh, they had the viruses have to go somewhere and we're a very attractive host being nearly 8 billion of us. And in addition to that, you're seeing, we're now seeing emerging pathogens coming from melting uh, permafrost in uh, Siberia, Northern Canada and Scandinavia, uh, uh, pathogens which have been dormant for 40, 50,000 years. And this is going to be an ongoing problem. I mean, vaccinations may be a band-aid for this, but the real cause is diminishment of ecosystems and diminishment of species. And if we're gonna get this under control, then we have to learn to live in harmony with all of those other species that we share this planet with. There are three basic laws of ecology. The first is the uh, law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. The second is the law of interdependence, that all those species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And the third is the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And when we steal the carrying capacity of other, spe uh, of other species, that is a diminishment of both diversity and of interdependence. Those are the basic laws of ecology and no species has ever survived on this planet by living outside of the three basic laws of ecology. And so that's part of the educational program that we try to, uh, to bring to the public through, through our actions. Right now we have about 250 volunteers from 25 different countries on those 10 ships. And also uh, we have additional volunteers on on uh, non-ship campaigns, for instance, on the island of Mayotte between uh, uh, Madagascar and Mozambique. We're trying to stop the poaching of turtles there. We're doing uh, sea turtle uh, protection uh, campaigns on the beaches in Nicaragua, uh, of uh, Costa Rica, uh, Panama and Colombia. And, uh, you know, saving every year tens of thousands of, uh, of sea turtles um, in the process. So this is really a global um, problem and that's why we have a global movement to address it. And I think that we're um, empowering a lot of people to understand that each and every one of us, can we have the power to make a difference. All you have to do is harness your passion for whatever you're concerned about to the virtues of imagination and courage and you can literally uh, change the world. So a lot of my um, crew members have gone on and founded their own organization and got involved in, in movements and campaigns where they've made a, a significant uh, difference uh, as a result. So th that basically is really what Sea Shepherd is. We're, one, we're just one group amongst uh, many because uh, the strength of an ecosystem is in diversity. Therefore, the strength of, uh, of any movement has to be in diversity. And that doesn't matter whether you approach is education or litigation or legislation or direct intervention, it all works out towards the same end. We have to do what, what, we're, we're, what we do best, 
with our own skills and our abilities. And uh, I'm seeing this happening more and more and more, especially amongst young people around the world, that they see what the future, where we're heading to, and they're trying to do everything they can to, uh, to, to make sure that, uh, you know, it's not going to be as bad as a lot of people think it's going to be. Uh, sometimes people ask me whether um, I'm concerned about the future or if I ever get pessimistic or depressed. And I, I, I don't really, because uh, back in, uh, way back in 1973, I was a volunteer for the American Indian Movement during the occupation of Wounded Knee in South Dakota. It was a fight against the U.S. government. And uh, the American Indian Movement was surrounded by 3,000 federal uh, agents who were firing into the village every night, 20,000 rounds a night, and they killed two wounded 46. That's when I went to Russell Means, who was the leader of the American Indian Movement, and I said, look, we have no uh, hope of winning here. We're overwhelmed. Uh, the odds are against us. We cannot win. What are we doing here? And his answer really has stayed with me ever since. He said, we're not concerned about winning or losing. We're not concerned about the odds against us. We're here because this is the right place to be, the right time to do it, and the right thing to do. In other words, focus on the present. You can't do anything about the future. And let, all you can do is focus on the present, and that will define what the future will be. So no, don't worry about that. Just focus on the present, and that can make all of uh, the difference in the world. And sometimes, sometimes when it looks like the, the, the problem is impossible to solve, we have to just rely on the fact that sometimes the answer to an impossible problem is to find the impossible solution. I mean, the very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would become uh, president of South Africa was impossible, it was unthinkable. And yet the impossible became possible. And I think that that is something that holds true in, in every movement. You just have to dare to think the impossible and come up with, uh, with uh, solutions. So uh, like I said, Sea Shepherd's been uh, doing this for over four, four decades now. It's a growing movement. We're getting more and more ships because there's a need for more and more ships. And uh, those ships are really, I think, making a difference. And we can measure our success by the number of whales and dolphins and seabirds and sea turtles and sharks that we have saved. One, uh, one uh, vessel that we stopped off of South Africa uh, and stopped permanently uh, based on the number of sharks that it had in its hold, we estimated that uh, we prevented that one particular vessel from killing 600,000 sharks in, in total. The number of sharks being taken every year is about 80 to 90 million in total. And a lot of this is being taken in sanctuaries and marine reserves, about 300,000 taken alone out of the Galapagos Marine Reserve, for example. And sharks are a very, very important part of a marine ecosystem and uh, a lot of ecosystems, especially coral reef systems, will collapse if we remove the shark as an apex uh, predator. It's a real difficult thing protecting sharks, of course, because a lot of people are afraid of sharks with no real good reason. The, um, you know, the number of people killed by sharks every year on average is five. Number of people killed by Coca-Cola machines following them on, on them every year is nine. So Coke machines are more dangerous than sharks. And it's actually more dangerous to play golf than it is to go into the ocean and swim with sharks because more people die every year from lightning strikes and bee stings on golf courses than people die from shark, shark attacks. They, uh, as Kelly Slater, the world famous uh, surfer said, if you're afraid of sharks, the answer is simple. Just don't go into the ocean. It's their water. It's their home. And uh, so, but I found myself, I've swam with sharks all my life, including great white sharks, and uh, they're not the monsters that uh, Hollywood and others would like to depict them as. In fact, uh, they're far more important to this planet in many ways uh, than, than we are. And that really brings me to this uh, understanding that uh, we have to realize that to survive, we have to live in harmony with all other species. And we have to recognize that we're not the total dominant and most important species on this planet. A few years ago, I had a, a reporter from the Fox Network in the United States called me up and he said, did you say that bees and trees, worms and fish were more important than people? And I said, yeah, I did, I did say that. And he said, well, how can you say something so outrageous as to say worms, bees, trees, and fish are more important than people? I said, well, I said it because they're more important than people for a very simple reason. They can live here without us. We can't live here without them. We need them. They don't need us. And if we don't learn to live with all of these other species, we're simply not going to survive 
ourselves. Our entire civilization can collapse as a result. Since 1950, there's been a 40% diminishment in phytoplankton populations in the world's seas. 40% diminishment of phytoplankton. Now, what does that mean? Phytoplankton provides up to 70% of the oxygen in the air we breathe, the rest coming from plants and trees. If phytoplankton disappears from the sea tomorrow, we all die. We do not live on this planet without phytoplankton. That shows you how important those species are. Phytoplankton is the foundation of, of the food pyramid in the entire ocean. Phytoplankton also sequesters enormous amounts of carbon every year. But for the most part, people don't even give it any thought, what is phytoplankton? But phytoplankton is the basis for life. And therefore, uh, if we, if we lose it, we're in deep trouble. And why is it being diminished? That's the reason. And the thing is, is that phytoplankton are plants and therefore they need fertilizer, primarily nutrients. Those nutrients, uh, nitrogen mainly, iron, um, iron and nitrogen together are supplied by the feces of marine mammals, seabirds and fish. Uh, one blue whale every day defecates three tons onto the surface of the sea, heavily rich in nitrogen and iron and that is a nutrient base for the phytoplankton. In many ways, the whales are farmers in the ocean. All species are interdependent. They're all linked. They all contribute something together. And uh, so I like to really uh, equate it to this. If Look at the Earth as a spaceship, which is what it is. We're on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy, and every spaceship has a life support system. And that life support system provides us with the air we breathe, the, the food uh, and water we drink, and regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system is run, it's maintained by a crew, a crew of engineers of Earth planes, not us. We humans, we're having a wonderful time amusing ourselves, but we're not maintaining the machinery that keeps us all alive. What we are doing, however, is murdering those crew members, those engineers. And uh, there's only so many engineers you can destroy before the machinery begins to fall apart. We can't lose the bees, we can't lose the worms, we can't lose so many valuable microbes and so many valuable fungi and so many valuable fish and marine mammals and seabirds. We cannot lose them without uh, having some enormous ecological consequences. So we have to get away from this idea that somehow we're better than everything else, that we're dominant over everything else. In other words, we have to look at it from a biocentric point of view and not from an anthropocentric point of view. You know, a lot of people think that human beings, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that human beings are more intelligent than other animals. Well, that really on, depends upon what your um, definition of intelligence is. I was uh, debating um, a Norwegian whaler on this, and he says, but Watson, you say that whales are more intelligent than people. This is a very stupid thing to say. And I say, yeah, well, I, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with our ecosystems. And by that criteria, whales are more intelligent than people. And he looked at me and says, oh, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than people. I said, George, you're beginning to understand exactly what I'm trying to tell you. You know, this is what intelligence is, to be able to live in harmony with all other species uh, on this planet. But our, our human intelligence is based on eye-to-hand coordination, primarily the manipulation of tools. Individually, we're not that intelligent. Collectively, we are. I mean, each and every one of us, if stranded on an island, doesn't know how to build a bicycle uh, or this or that or whatever we needed. But we also take a look at, uh, you know, the intelligence of cetaceans, which I happen to believe are far more intelligent than we are, but they don't have hands and they don't manipulate tools and they don't have a technology. But the average size of a human brain is 1,700 cubic centimeters. The average size of an orca brain is 6,000 cubic centimeters. And the average size of a sperm whale brain, the largest brain to ever evolve on this planet, is 9,000 cubic centimeters. And there is more convolutions on the neocortex area of cetacean brains than on the human brain. Plus, all mammals from mice to people have three lobe brains where cetaceans have four lobe brains, the most highly uh, complex brain ever developed. And therefore, what, what is it used for? Well, the English language has 400,000 words in it. Humpback whale, 
about 2 million different vocal components. So um, when it comes down to communications and everything, they are far more advanced than we are. We just simply say that we're more intelligent without any real scientific evidence to back it up. I remember in biology 101, you know, the professor would put a, a, a brain up of a, of, a, of a dog and another one of a monkey and another one of a human. And, and uh, you can see or a rat brain, actually, you can see that the dog brain is bigger than the rat brain and then the monkey's bigger than that and, and the human's bigger than and the convolutions are, are more pronounced on the human. They never, ever put an orca or a sperm whale brain up there because it makes us look like really, really stupid. And we don't like to look stupid, so we just simply ignore that fact. But there, are, I believe that through the use of computers and that we will be able to one day communicate with cetaceans. And uh, there are scientists who are seriously working on that. Not sure we really want to hear what they have to say about us, but uh, you know, it, it's going to be interesting. I do know that uh, in my own experience, uh, you know, you don't walk up to a lion in Serengeti and pat it on the head and say, nice kitty. But I have swum with orcas uh, in uh, the waters of British Columbia in Antarctica. And uh, this is the most powerful, most formidable predator on the planet. And yet it allows us to swim with them. And there's not one single case of a wild orca ever attacking and killing a human being. There is in the ones that are in captivity. Uh, Tilikum killed uh, three people and uh, another casualty in the Canary Islands. And they say, well, see, they, they kill people. Yes, in captivity, but it's like walking through a maximum security yard of a, of a prison and uh, turning your back on the inmates, really. These orcas have been driven to insanity by captivity. And uh, recently I wrote a book called Orcapedia, which is a history of the, uh, of the orca slave trade. The fact that 265 orcas have died while in captivity and 65 are still in captivity around, uh, around the world. This is a slave trade uh, profiting off of the misery and the deaths of intelligent sentient beings. I wanna just uh, share with you one thing, why I got involved in doing what I'm doing. You know, I really got started when I was 10 years old rescuing beavers from beaver traps in eastern Canada where I was raised. But in 1975, we had this idea to uh, protect whales by going out and uh, putting our bodies between the uh, whales and the, and the harpoons. We were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, and I guess we thought that this is going to work, and it was a nonviolent tactic. And uh, I found myself uh, in a small inflatable boat in front of a, a Soviet harpoon vessel in the North Pacific that was bearing down on us at full speed. And uh, in front of us were eight sperm whales that were fleeing for their lives. And every time that the uh, harpooner tried to take a shot, I would maneuver the boat to block the harpoon. And this worked for about 20 minutes until the captain on the Soviet vessel come running, running down the, the, the catwalk. And he screamed into the ear of the, uh, of the uh, harpooner and then looked down on us, smiled and brought his finger across his throat. And that's when I realized Gandhi was not gonna work for us that day. And a few moments later, there was this horrendous explosion as this uh, grenade tipped harpoon flew over our head and slammed into the backside of a female sperm whale of the pod in front of us. She rolled over on her side, she screamed, there was blood everywhere, and suddenly the largest um, whale, the, the big bull in the, in the pod, slapped the water with his tail, dove and swam right underneath of us, threw himself up out of the water straight at the Soviet harpooner, who was ready for him with an unattached harpoon. And he pulled the trigger, the whale scream fell back, there was blood everywhere, he was rolling in agony on the surface. And as he did so, I caught his eye. And... Uh, he dove again, and this time I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast. And he came up and out of the water at an angle so that the next move would to fall down on top of us. And as his head rose out of the water, and I looked into this eye, so close I could see my own reflection in the eye, what I saw there really changed my life forever because what I saw was understanding that the whale understood what we were trying to do because I could see the effort he made to pull himself back. He began to slide back into the sea. I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface and he died. He could have killed us, he chose not to do so. So I owe my life to the fact that that whale made that decision. But I also saw something else in that eye, pity, not for himself, but for us, that we could take life so remorselessly and so mercilessly. And why? Why were those Russians killing those whales? They didn't eat them. They killed them for oil, spermaceti oil. And one of the things that it was most prized for was in uh, lubricating, high heat resistant lubricating oil. And one of the things they wanted it most for was the 
maintenance and construction of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said to myself, here we are. We're killing these incredibly beautiful, intelligent, socially complex, sentient, self-aware creatures for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it hit me. We're insane. We're totally, grossly insane. Is this what we're all about? And I said to myself at the time, what I do from here on in, I do for them, not us, for them. So uh, in 1986, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet. We destroyed their whale processing plant. We shut down their whaling operations for 17 years. I had a former colleague when I was with Greenpeace, he came up to me and he said, what you did in Iceland was reprehensible, unforgivable, and you're an embarrassment to the movement. And I said, so? And he says, well, aren't you concerned about what people think about you? I said, no, not at all. We didn't sink those whaling ships for you or for any human being. We sunk them for the whales. Find me one whale on this planet that disagreed with what we did. And I promise you, we won't do it again. But until then, we're going to continue to do it. And we sank another uh, six in Norway. And uh, we shut down the Japanese whaling fleet. And we shut down uh, the Australians. We shut down the Spanish whaling fleets. And uh, we did so without injuring anybody um, in, in the process. So uh, that's my story here. And uh, I'd be very pleased to answer any questions if anybody has any. Or if not. <laughs> there we go. All right, there we are. I just unmuted everyone. Sorry, Captain Watson. That was, that was a great talk. And yeah, does anyone have any questions? I will just talk to Mention the questions here in the microphone so that Captain wants to hear. If you do, just raise your hand, just, just shout it out. Um, I want to mention something though that if you're not familiar with Sea Shepherd, first of all, they have a booth here at the, at this event. It's down this direction on this street on the right. If you go down this half on the right, you can talk to more folks about Sea Shepherd there. And also, I'm not that familiar with the seas, but obviously, I've met Captain Watson in person at our Mountain Veg Fest up in New England two years ago when we did that. And um, I was, what really got me thinking after listening to you and, and talking to you is that so much goes on out in the ocean so we're not aware of, because that we all pretty much spend all of our time here on land. And, you know, we have, a, we have law enforcement and things to keep things in line, but Captain Watson, is there any, anyone who's really out there in the, in the, in the oceans who's, who's enforcing this besides you? I mean, you, you all are trying to make sure that laws are enforced, right? I mean, but, but is it, is there a system like we have here on land or are you the system? Well, what we, uh, you know, for a long time, we were operating uh, by ourselves um, in, under the guidance of the uh, UN World Charter for Nature, which allows for non-government organizations to intervene against these illegal activities. But since 2015, we've been involved in partnerships with numerous nations. Now, that all stemmed out of uh, 2015, uh, our campaign to stop uh, the poaching of Patagonia and Antarctic toothfish in southern ocean near the waters of antarctica uh, a toothfish is actually marketed as a fish called the chilean sea bass it's not from chile and it's not a bass they just put that as a marketing name on the toothfish because it's not as marketable i guess anyway these uh, poachers were operating with impunity off the coast of antarctica and although interpol had the purple notices about them meaning they were illegal nobody was doing anything australia and new zealand were just ignoring them so we decided to go out after them and uh, we, they, first of all, the Australian government said, well, you're not going to find them. Then the Australian government also threatened us that if we pull any nets, they would charge us with the illegal fishing for pulling up illegal nets. But anyway, after eight days, uh, we sent two vessels, this Steve Irwin and the, uh, Sam, uh, the Sam Simon, and uh, we found the vessel called the Thunder, the most notorious of them all. And uh, that chase began. They dropped their net and they ran. And uh, the Sam Simon came in behind to confiscate that net. Now, to give you an idea how big that net was, it was set two kilometers deep. It took us 200 hours to pull it up. It was 72 kilometers long, and it weighed 70 tons. That was one net from one ship. And then we, uh, the Bob Barker chased the, uh, the uh, Thunder for 110 days. It was the longest pursuit of a poacher in maritime history. And uh, they chased it all the way from the coast of Antarctica up into the Indian Ocean, around the Cape of Go uh, Good Hope, and into the waters of San Tome in Western Africa. And there, the Thunder with no place to go, the captain of the Thunder scuttled his own ship. He sank it right in front of us, and we filmed it. And the reason he did that was to destroy the evidence on board, because there's no place he could go without being arrested. 
But we boarded the sinking ship. We got the evidence. Uh, the captain went to prison for three years. The two officers for two years. The company was fined 17 million euros. So, uh, but, so what I'm saying is since 2015, we've now started these programs because Interpol and these various governments saw what we were doing and decided you know, what we were doing was something they could, uh, they could get poured. Now they're actually teaching what we do in the, uh, the United States Naval College. And uh, we've also been invited to uh, participate in the um, American Security Project and um, in order to work directly with navies of the world to, to stop illegal poaching, which is a direct threat to national security in many countries. Okay, very good. Also, I know that um, one of the big things we hear about, especially in the plant-based uh, vegan movements is the idea of fishless oceans at some point in time. Can you touch on that and tell us what your thoughts are about potential fishless oceans? Yeah, we co-produced a film called Sea Spiracy, which got a lot of play on Netflix and a lot of people saw that. And uh, uh, one of the things that it looked at was the study of Dr. Uh, Boris Worm and Dr. Daniel Pauly. Uh, and they're, they're the two foremost fisheries biologists in the world today. And they, uh, Dr. Worm said that uh, by 2048, that uh, fisheries worldwide would collapse. He later came back and said that uh, that wasn't quite accurate. It would be about 2078. And uh, I said, well, it doesn't really matter. It's 48 or 78. But uh, uh, what that means is that all commercial fisheries will have collapsed by then. I think that he's being very optimistic. Uh, my prediction is commercial fishing will collapse by 2030 uh, based on what's happening right now. Uh, there is no sustainable fishery in the world. I, I guess people could argue that the Alaska wild salmon fishery is sustainable because of the hatcheries, but every other one is, uh, we take it out, we put nothing back in. And uh, so they are collapsing. Now, you know, in, 19, in 1985, I, I predicted that the Northern cod fishery would collapse. And by 1992, it did collapse. And up until the day it collapsed, the Canadian government said, there is no way, Watson, you don't know what you're talking about. We have the best scientists, the best scientific uh, uh, models on this, you're wrong. But it happened in 92. And the reason being is that this, the biologists who work for industry, the biologists who work for governments, I have a name for them. I call them biostitutes. They give the governments, the corporations, the answers they want, and that's what they're paid to do. But when you take independent scientists like Dr. Boris Wern or Dr. Daniel Pauly, who work for universities, then you get a far more uh, uh, you know, correct answer as to what's happening in our oceans. But our oceans are in trouble. Every fishery is in trouble. You might have heard uh, of a fish back in the 90s called the orange ruffy, which is big around New Zealand and in those waters. It used to be in fish markets everywhere. You don't see it anymore. And the reason being is that uh, this is a fish that takes 45 years to become sexually mature and lives to be almost 200 years of age. It cannot keep up with the demand that we are putting it under. I mentioned earlier, we kill 65 billion animals every year on land, but we kill trillions of fish. We don't even know the numbers that are taken there. And we're taking, and not only are so many killed for, to feed chickens and pigs and everything, but not many people realize that domestic cats eat 2.8 million tons of fish every year are just killed for the pet, for the cat food. And in fact, domestic cats eat more fish than all of the seals in the North Atlantic Ocean. Chickens now eat more fish than all the albatross and puffins in the world. And this is a world out of balance. Yeah, well, just by show of hands, who has seen uh, Sea Spiracy? I'll get your question. Who has seen it? If you, if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out online. I also want to mention one thing before we get to your question is Whale Wars. Has anyone seen the show Whale Wars? Because then you know, well, only a few of you, but Captain Watson, that's his show. They, they show what Sea Shepherd does in these boats down in Antarctica to try to stop the poaching of whales. And I know my wife and I have watched it. It's available online. So if you haven't seen Whale Wars, definitely check it out. What's your question? Uh, right now, how many ships of uh, people and, and fish are there actively being harvested, catching? How many, how many ships are in the world's fishing? Okay, the question is, Captain Watson, how many ships compromise the world's shipping fleet, or fishing fleets, I'm sorry, how many ships total, how many people are involved, how many tons, yes, how many tons of, of fish are they pulling out on, I don't know, a, an annual basis, do you know these things? 
there's about four million registered fishing vessels uh, in the world, of, uh, and but about uh, the entire number of fishing vessels, forty percent of them are operating illegally. So it's pretty hard to really know what is being taken, where they're operating. We're constantly catching them, and uh, we're constantly being uh, surprised. The real problem is we have this thing called transshipment, which is that the the vessels will catch fish and they'll put them into a big fish, a uh, big uh, ship to take directly to China or Japan or Spain, and it's pretty hard to really track the amounts that are being taken. So we really don't know. But we do know that industrial fishing could not survive without massive subsidies uh, from the EU, from the United States, from uh, from all over the world, uh, China, whatever, they're subsidized. Industrial fishing cannot survive without those subsidies. In order to get less and less fish, you need much more sophisticated equipment. You need $100 million tra drag trawlers. You need 100-mile-long lawn lines, 100-mile-long uh, uh, gill nets. Uh, this kind of technology is extremely expensive, and uh, without those subsidies, they simply couldn't afford it. Right now, there are about five uh, that I know of, five industrial super trawlers while operating in UK waters that are registered in the ne Netherlands. I don't, why isn't anything being done about them? I don't know, but uh, they shouldn't be there uh, stealing the fish out of UK waters. But that's a problem that is happening all over the world with uh, with this plundering. One of the worst offenders um, uh, in Europe for, for illegal fishing is Spain. Okay, uh, you just mentioned that these fishing industries are being subsidized by the government. That sounds like we what we hear about animal agriculture too. So it sounds, or, I mean, land, I'm focusing on land. You obviously are focusing on the sea. I'm just not familiar with it, but I, I didn't realize that that was also an issue there. I'd only known about subsidies for, for land animals and things. That's interesting. Yeah, the, the amount of money spent on subsidies by world governments uh, to support the fishing industry is about 76 billion a year. Yeah, it's quite a bit. Any other questions? Okay, question. Go ahead. Can you please give an update on the Faroe Islands atrocity? Can you please give an update on the Faroe Islands atrocity? Uh, sea Shepherd UK and Sea Shepherd Denmark have people in the Faroes right now, and we also have a lot of Faroese who are getting involved, and especially since the killing of one thousand four hundred. <laughs> white-sided dolphins uh, just about a month ago, which was something that was so horrific that uh, even many Faroese uh, were, were quite shocked by it. Uh, the um, One of the senators for the Jersey Isles uh, has called for a, uh, action to be taken on this. And I think that one of his ideas is actually a very good one is that the, the Jersey Island football team will not play the Pharaohs. And now we're talking to Scotland about doing the same thing. They're very, very um, supportive of their football team. And uh, I think that's where we put a lot of pressure on us to get uh, is to boycott them uh, in playing with uh, teams throughout Europe or throughout Britain. Also to uh, organize a boycott of their products, uh, which unfortunately are mainly fish. But uh, so if you're vegan, you really can't do, you're already doing that. But uh, but that's another thing that we, we can do and a boycott of tourism and everything. But they are coming under enormous pressure and we just have to keep that, that pressure on. Uh, I just find it incredible that, uh, you know, that, that in Europe, in this day and age, that this kind of slaughter goes on. They don't even eat them. Of the 1,428 uh, white-sided dolphins that were taken, most of them were incinerated. They were disposed of. And uh, because this is not done for out of necessity, it's not done for food. Um, you take the amount of a uh, pilot whale and dolphin meat taken every year by the number of people in the Faroe Islands, it's far, far too much for anybody for them to consume. They do it because it's tradition and they like to do it. All right, Captain Watson, the question is, what kind of social and cultural changes would need to take place to, I guess, reverse and solve these issues here, right, with, uh, with the fishing uh, and just consuming fish in general? Well, the good thing, I think, is that uh, transition to uh, plant-based diets, to vegan diets, is something which is a, it's a growing movement. It's a rapidly growing movement. And uh, it's now attracting a lot of uh, attention from corporations and from uh, from celebrities and that kind of thing. And uh, I think that this ultimately is the solution that we transition to a plant-based uh, diet 
in our society, uh, not only for animal welfare reasons, animal rights reasons, but also for environmental conservation reasons. And uh, it's really the only thing that's going to, to save us because there's simply, there's, simply, there's simply no room on this planet for 8 billion uh, fish-eating, meat-eating primates. It was never meant to be that that way. It's an unnatural situation. One of the things I always find quite funny about people who eat, do eat meat, meat is that they say, uh, well, you know, uh, you know, we're naturally carnivores and we're like lions and wolves. No, we're not. We've never been carnivores. We've always been necrovores. That is, we eat dead bodies. We're more akin to jackals and buzzards and vultures. Uh, no, we're certainly not carnivores. And uh, so the bodies that we eat, the dead bodies that we eat, in many cases have been dead for six months, sometimes a couple of years. And uh, this, when you go, if you go into a, a butcher market in South America and one in the Western world, you can see the difference. A butcher, a butchery in South America, the meat is gray, greenish, black. It's, it's pretty ugly. But in supermarkets, it's nice and red and everything because they put the crushed bodies of beetles in there and they put bleach on it and they put all these chemicals to keep it looking like it's like it just been uh, just been killed when in fact it was killed many, many weeks or months or even years ago. So uh, it's, uh, you know, when really when you people look at just how disgusting it is, but a lot, of course, people just don't want to see it. They're in, a, they're in sort of denial, saying that they are in denial and climate change and things like that. But, uh, but I think gradually it's coming around. I mean, when you get McDonald's and uh, Burger King coming out with, uh, with meat alternatives, that shows that there's progress be, being made. Okay, so the bottom line is just vote with your dollar, right? With what you eat. Well, what we, what we eat does make a significant difference uh, in the world, of course. Uh, and uh, if we, it, you know, like I said before, the, the meat industry is the single greatest contributor to groundwater pollution, uh, dead zones in the ocean, and, and uh, greenhouse gases. It's as simple as that. Uh, this is really a question of, uh, of survival. Okay, so overall plant-based diet will help because not only, like you're saying, it's not going to, it's going to do more than just address the fishing, fishing issue. It's going to address the water pollution, the pollution of the seas, pollution of the oceans, it sounds like. Yeah, so we have to understand that life in the sea is there to maintain a life support system for all life, including our life. We need the phytoplankton to be replenished. We need the sharks to keep the coral reefs uh, uh, healthy. We need, uh, you know, whales and uh, marine mammals and everything to supply the nutrients to the phytoplankton. We need to look at the ocean as a, as a life support system, which is what it is. All right, that's very interesting. I think a lot of new information for a lot of people here. Any other final questions? Yes. Okay, and the question is, is there, is there any hope, uh, or mainly because what you said, how, how powerful the governments are, how, I guess, the industries as well, right? All these influences, is there, well, how do you feel about, uh, I guess, so it has to be a big paradigm shift or pendulum swing, right, for, for that for that balance to change. How do you feel about that, Captain Watson? Well, it's going to come about because of the passion, the courage, and the imagination of individuals. It's certainly not going to come about because of government. I mean, uh, through the history of social revolutions and change, governments have really not done very much. I mean, slavery in the United States was not ended by Abraham Lincoln. It was ended by the, uh, the passion of people like Wilberforce and Douglas. Women in the United States, for example, didn't get the right to vote because of uh, of uh, Woodrow Wilson, he was their main opponent until he was forced to sign the uh, the amendment giving women the right to vote. It came about because of the courage and the passion, the imagination of thousands of women who were part of the suffragette movement. It's the it's it's people that make make the difference. You know why? Personally, I find that Greta Thunberg's uh, has reached millions of people and. And uh, just as one one person has done so much, and we're seeing more and more of that. Uh, and it really illustrates how one person can make a difference. Because of Diane Fossey, we still have mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Because of David Wingate, a biologist in Bermuda, the just Bermuda storm petrel did not go extinct. So you can make a significant difference by just focusing your, all your uh, passion in an area that you want to change and just do it. And don't be deterred by criticism. Just do it. Very good. Yeah, any more? I saw someone else's. Yes. Okay. 
see a lot of that. And also, see like Okay, the question is about the trash and the, the used fishing nets in the ocean. Wondering if you personally see that and have you rescued wildlife from that? Well, we're rescuing wildlife from uh, fishing gear all the time and also from plastic in the ocean. It's a, it's a major, major problem. Uh, actually, what's even more dangerous is the plastic you don't see, which is called microplastic, which gets into the bodies of fish and ultimately into the bodies of humans and eat fish. But also, it's, a, it's actually getting into the plankton itself. So microplastics are a significant uh, uh, problem. And it comes from so many different sources. In fact, even your automobile tires are losing little pieces all the time when you get out, washed down into the, into, the, into the ocean. So yeah, plastic pollution is a major problem. We do see it all the time. We do rescue animals from, uh, from fishing gear all the time. All right, I think, I think that might be it. And I see you have someone in the background there, Captain Watson. <laughs> oh, that's my uh, son, Tiger. Come here. Oh, that's my son, Tiger. <laughs> hey, hello. Welcome. You're at Loudon Veg Fest here in Leesburg, Virginia, Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C., the capital. So, are you, you guys up in New England? You, you actually you're going somewhere. I know that. So your time's just about uh, we're just about done. So we'll let you go. We're very thankful that you have been here, Captain Watson. I think you've conveyed a lot of information. Even me, every time I hear from you, there's something new I'm learning, and something like you said, we each have our different areas where we can focus on what we can do best or ideas that we have. And I think you've given a lot of people different ideas here just by by uh, talking to us today. Oh, well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Great for you. Well, give everybody a round of applause, please, to Captain Paul Watson, Sea Shepherd. Be sure you go to the Sea Shepherd booth. It's down this side, that side, and on the right. So it's kind of in the middle area. So thank you, Captain Watson. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Where can I find more of this? I guess.